Welcome, coaches. Uh, we will get into it. Um, first up, we're going to have Coach Jamie O'Loughlin. Um, just quickly introduce Coach, and thank you, Coach, for giving up your time. Um, I made sure I had the Taipans jersey in the background this week, so um, lucky we had one of them hanging around. Uh, Coach, obviously extensive um, resume, uh, NBL level with uh, Perth and now Cairns, um, but also a long history with the Australian uh, junior program um, in various roles, uh, state program, uh, Geelong Supercats, Siebel coach, uh, very well-credentialed coach uh, and looking forward to learning from you tonight. So I'll hand over now, Coach. I think you're on mute still. How are we going now? Now we've got you. Yeah, no, thanks for that, uh, that introduction, mate. So yeah, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I just want to first start off by just saying a uh, a big thank you uh, to Reese and to Wyndham Basketball for these um, coaching experiences, uh, opportunities for people to grow. It's um it's a really good resource, and and uh, you know I'm I'm uh, I feel privileged to be able to uh, not only listen to them but uh, now to be part of it and part of the sharing. Um, in uh, in Tonight's, uh, tonight's talk, um, I just want to look at covering quite a broad uh, look at uh, on-ball screening in, with a preference towards looking at uh, the NBL and, and what's sort of happening in um, the pro side of it, but um, also trying to make sure that that, um, that dovetails into what uh, everybody else is doing along uh, their part of the pathway. Um, you know, if we were to take a deep dive into on-ball screening, uh, I think we could probably do a 10-part, a uh, two-hour series uh, just to get through it. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, a very, very complex part of the game um, and obviously particularly common part of the game for us. So, uh, as I said, tonight will be more of a, um, a broad stroke overview of, um, of things that are happening uh, in the space where, where I am and also where I've been. Um, and hopefully from that, um, you know, I can give to everybody right across the board something to go away with, something they might be able to uh, implement in their own program or at least food for thought um, and something that they can discuss uh, amongst themselves or even, um, you know, with, with myself at a, a later date. Um, and so we'll just look at some, some thoughts I have, some concepts, uh, some trends, and as I said, with a bit of an M NBL um, influence. Um, so if I just, uh, I'll get a little bit of sh screen share happening. Um, Reese, are you able to allow me to share that screen? Yep, I'll just do that now, sorry. So tonight, we'll, I'll, I'll just have a few slides to roll through, but also um, get to some video. So hopefully that won't cause us any, um, any issues. We'll be able to, um, to roll through it, but obviously, Reese, if there's any if there's any lag there, let me know and we'll see what we can do about it. Um, is that good? Yep. All right. So um, the on-ball screening, um, and I'll just swing that across so I can see it a little bit better. Um, I just want to start by um, trying to discuss what what coaching and the coaching relationship um, means to me and. Uh, our part in it. So if, if, and I was thinking about this just over the last few days and wh what's helped form my ideas. Um, my journey now is, has hit the 30 year mark as a basketball coach. And um, it, it started uh, the first 15 years were kind of one phase. And it seems like this, ne the next 15 years have been another. And the first 15 years, tried to just make a really simple graphic, but you know, 15 years in association development and school basketball, you know, some time with Geelong basketball te teams at the representative level, state teams, state programs, high performance programs, and started to break into some national team stuff. Um, then lucky enough to move over into uh, the space with national teams in international competitions, uh, then head coach at the senior level. So uh, the Super Cats for all, um, for nine years there as an assistant and a head coach, and then the last six years in the in the NBL. Now, 
I, I talk about that because um, the only reason I bring that up is that uh, I feel like I've, at this point, I've already had a little taste of just about everything and um, can kind of um, easily understand where everyone's at. So when, when they pose their questions about um, how maybe they could do something better or differently, I want some feedback. I feel like I can draw on some of those experiences. So um, certainly hopeful that I can do that in tonight's presentation. But bigger than that is the, the, the picture of or the pictures along the bottom of the screen. And um, these men have been instrumental um, to me and for, for me are um, great examples of what being in the coaching community is. So in, in Geelong... Coach, sorry. Um, we've still got the um, front, the first slide. Oh, sorry. I'm not sure why, but we do. Yep. Yep, that's good. Yep, sorry about that. All good. I'll just swing that across there because that was in my way. Um, so, yeah, so sorry about that. You, so you just see it's a really simple graphic, but as I said, it's more about, it's more about um, then how has that helped shape uh, my thoughts around um, coaching and something for you to think about. But... Um, you know, Cole Darrington, Owen Hewan, Marty Hansen, Guy Malloy, Pat Hunt. Now, um, I worked with Guy Malloy in some ju national junior team stuff, but um, but he has been for me a a mentor and someone to continue the, who continually shares the game, and that's what's in common with all these other men who have helped me along the way. But um, the biggest thing for me is not only have they helped me, but they helps have helped so many others, um, and. They do it through just sharing, constantly sharing, constantly trying to make everyone else around them better. Um, and, and for mine, that's you know, the, one of the biggest parts of, of coaching and being um, in, in this cohort. Um, and so hopefully, um, you know, everybody else um, plays their part in that sharing of information um, and upskilling others and, and helping others along the way. But these guys are completely selfless. Um, unfortunately, Marty passed away um, several years ago, but he's uh, he was a huge help to me along the way. And um, you know, I wish that I could still talk with him about the game because he was great to chat to um, and explore uh, different ways to go about things. So, you know, my learnings in that that thirty year time um, about coaching in general really are, you know, it's sharing the game is our responsibility. And, and we're part of it, and it's over to us to be uh, a key part of that continuing on. Um, that obviously, you know, reading and observing games and trainings and watching YouTube clips and whatever are great. Um, but the best part, the, the most helpful part for learning is going to be talking and doing, you know, approaching coaches that you um, admire or have seen their work or just uh, have coached against, um, you know, after the game. Uh, Maybe next week you're going to play against them, um, but just asking and talking and developing that way. And you're going to get more from that than you are from, from uh, the readings and, and observations without a question. And then obviously doing, you know, um, we get the listening phase, obviously, you know, ask those questions, tune in, listen intently, but then you just got to go out and do and grow through trial and error. And, and you're going to make a bunch of mistakes and, um, you know, nobody knows it all. Uh, I certainly don't know it all. Um, and I don't think I've never met anyone that genuinely knows it all. Um, maybe some think that they know more than others, but really we only know our little part. Um, and, you know, hopefully by just sharing that little part, it can help others. Um, the other thing is that we're all equal in this game. And I think sometimes perhaps questions don't get asked of coaches. Um, in different roles um, that might be perceived as perhaps more important because they're at a different level. Um, but I don't think that's, you know, true. You really, we're all part of the one uh, community. We're all, we're all trying to do the same thing and please approach um, coaches at other levels. Don't feel that because a coach might be the coach of the under 18s and you're coaching the 12s that, that you can't approach them or, or an NBL coach uh, is walking down the hallway that you can't go and approach them because we're all part of the same thing and we're all dependent upon each other to get to uh, the end game, which is to obviously help our players um, enjoy the game, love the game and grow the game. 
So, you know, if you, if you do your job in your space, then, then everyone else benefits. Um, you know, it's incumbent on, on um, you know, the state team coach, for example, to do a, a marvellous job with those kids and take them from where their rep team coach got them from. It's his job to do that. It's his part in it to do that and what's appropriate for him. But he needs the coach uh, that had them first to do their part so that they're ready to go play. And, and that's happening all the way along the line. Um, and we even see with guys at the NBL level that some were obviously taught incredibly well along the way and some, some you know, there were holes left. And, and so, you know, we're having to pick up the pieces at the later stages, which is, makes it really, really difficult and tougher for the players. And I guess just understanding what your part is, uh, what your role is in, in the phase of development of the players. You know, are they novice level and intermediate level, more of an expert level? And what do they need from you? Not, not so much the age, although the age is obviously part of it, but you can be, a, you know, an intermediate or, a, or an expert level player at the age of 16 or 17 um, because you've had a decade of coaching already and it's been at a high level. So um, it's not specifically just, well, 12s are this and 14s are that, but um, just getting to know your players, understand your role for them at that time and really embracing it. So just getting on to um, talking about the ball screening and, and again, just to start off as a bit of an overview, you know, it's obviously a highly efficient way to scoring and creating an advantage. It's um, high volume method in the pro game. Obviously, the, if you watch the NBA games, it feels like every possession has multiple ball screens. The Euro League is similar. The NBL had an awful lot of ball screening uh, this year just gone. Um, we find, you know, a uh, quick skim at some, some stats uh, via Synergy and, and the Jazz, for instance, you know, 25.8% of their possessions led to, led to a shot. And um, so that turned into 25 points a game. Now, that doesn't mean that was the amount of ball screens. It was a lot more than that because they don't chart after the ball screen. Maybe there was some other action that then led to the score. And so it gets categorized that way. So um, it's way more than that. But even that alone, to say 25 points a game come directly from the ball screen is, is huge. And we're seeing now as coaches continue to get creative, ball screens in all parts of the floor um, and all phases of the clock. Um, whether they're trying to, to really impact the defense and, and score quickly, or if it's uh, an opportunity just to sort of create a crack in the defense um, and allow some um, attack as the ball swings. The requirements for, uh, for on-ball screening and, and um, you know, it's, it's very, very important that we expose our players to screening actions um, along the way as part of their development. Um, there's, there's going to be a right time. You know, when do you introduce each type of screen um, to your players? And that's obviously relevant to, you know, where they are on, on their journey. Um, and, you know, implementing the ball screen um, at, at too early in their progression, you know, I believe can be detrimental to their development and their joy of the game because it's quite a complex phase of the game. Um, and you can, you could potentially be setting them up to fail because it's a, it's way beyond their mental uh, skills, physical skills uh, or general basketball skills. Uh, so picking the right moment to bring it in um, is particularly important. And if we dig a little bit a little bit deeper, you know, I'll try to break down a bit, um, you know, the ball handler, you know, their ability, and, and this is all high level. It's it's not introductory level at any of these in these areas. So the ability to dribble and pass uh, under physical pressure in confined spaces. The guard is going to be hit at times with traps and switches, um, different types of physical contact uh, in the ball screen itself, and then of co of course. Uh, in addition to that, any finishing moves towards the basket that they're going to have to make, which that area is growing daily, um, and shoot the ability to shoot off the dribble, which is um, obviously a little more difficult than catch and shoot situations. And you know the screener uh, ability to create space in, into the screen, recognition of angles, footwork in and out of screens, finishing towards the rim, relocation shooting out of the screen, um, and all those skills need to be in place. Um, the spaces, ability to relocate, uh, relocate shooting, second cut relocation, uh, or perhaps cutting to finish again in amongst traffic. Um, and then for everybody, uh, 
high level communication, synchronization. So being able to read their teammates, being able to read the coverage um, that the defense is throwing their way and then reacting with timing according to how you know, we've chosen to play against that type of coverage. And then because ball screening is not about directly screening straight out of the ball screen, a lot of the time it ends up in action secondary to that. So decision-making skills. You know, can you be a 0.5 second decision maker? And we put that pressure on, on our guys. Uh, and even at the NBL level, it's a challenge for some of them to just be that efficient, um, you know, with their decision making. Because really, as I said, most of the time, we're just creating a small crack in the defense, occasionally leading to a direct score, but mostly leading to us being, having a decision to shoot past a dribble quickly. And then a second player and a third player but also about respacing, um, cutting to the basket, giving uh, opportunity because the defense is slightly you know, off their spot. So the amount of things to work on is immense before a ball screen. And if we uh, reverse engineer um, and look at really we're ultimately getting the defense into rotation um, and we're having to make the 0.5 second decision. So can your athletes, um, make great decisions, make quick decisions as the ball flies to them and hits their hands? Can they make great decisions off the ball as they see a teammate make that read? Um, and, and obviously that's the stuff that is in every part of our game and is still the backbone um, for us being able to, to play out of the ball screen game uh, and have it be effective. So if we just have a little look and I'll just want to flick to um, some skills so bear with me for one second as I pull up the video. So Reese, if this uh, lags at all, just let me know, but hopefully um, we can optimize it and... No worries. How are we going with that? Yeah, it looks fine. Okay. So just some things that um, that we look at in general and, and um, great places to start, um, you know, ability moves off the dribble, finishing under contact, et cetera. But in this one, um, and I've, I've taken a lot of clips off our guys because obviously I know them better. I understand exactly what they're, they're trying to do, what they've been told. But attacking in a sort of semi-break scenario, getting into a quick, quick ball screen. And, you know, really good spacing at this time. The guys have identified it, spaced the floor pretty well. Scott comes down the floor. So Scott's our point guard uh, with the ball right now up in front of our bench. Um, you know, he's fantastic out of, out of ball screen. And just him challenging the defense away from the ball screen. So rejecting and that move right there. Can your players make great dribble moves to get past a guy and attack to the baseline? And then under contact, go and finish. You know, that's elite on the ball stuff right there that... Um, players need to have and one of the toughest things for defensive coverage on a pick and roll is to deal with the rejection of the pick and roll so um, great place to start for your ball handler another situation here so um, we've run a little bit of a slip screen scenario into the next ball screen and now the defense wants to try to cheat Corey Webster here defending uh, DJ Nuble. he wants to get the, the little advantage DJ's ability to read that scenario make a quick decision sharp dribble move and then go and attack the basket. Um, now, obviously, yep, not expecting uh, everybody to go and finish like that, but this part back in here, essential decision-making and skill acquisition. Again, notice the spacing of all of his teammates. They've really given him all, of, all the room in the world to operate. So this is all five players are key to pick and roll offense. Again, just standing start, rip. And the impact, DJ, and even with it, the defense not really jumping super hard, but it impacts the defense significantly. They do a heck of a job of covering back, but then can your players you know, make great passes out of that uh, help? Um, again, another skill set. Um, can they do it under physical pressure? Maybe double teams, maybe single coverage, bouncing off a chest. Do they have the footwork and the passing that's, that's right? And then you know, do they have the shooting? Because if they don't, then that kick-out pass gets then guarded and then you're back to square one. So, um, again, expanding now into the roller. Skill set, 
Good spacing here. Scott reads the drop cover, sees the floor. He's got two great options on the other side. So his vision and passing skills and decision-making skills all on display right here. Um, finds it now decision-making. This is what I'm talking about. Doesn't have to be pick and roll for this. This happens at the, at the very start of all basketball. And DJ making a decision, hard close out, quick kick on, next decision. That's not a contest from Nick Kay in this instance for a player like Cam Oliver. So his decision is to rise up and shoot it basically uncontested. Last one to look at in general skill set for, the, for everybody involved. So we have a, a bit of a horn spacing entry here. The defense are really trying to get after us. Um, so the guys read, read it. They re-space. So we didn't get uh, a direct score, but we, now we've cracked the defense a little bit. We swing it on. We re-space. This is a different shape now off the ball. Different part of the floor ball screen. Uh, they see the aggressive defense. They, they react according to our, our rules again. Communication from Nate right there, instructing what he wants as we come out of the ball screens. You can see him pointing and demonstrating what advantage we might be able to get out of it. And the great spacing, Scott's dragged his man away. We find Nate. We get to a third ball screen. They're still after us. We reshape again. That's a new spacing, a third spacing already. Everybody's recognized how they can help each other out. Scott attacks the hard cover. Nate spaces. Two shooters space and quite makes a really nice flash to the middle of the lane where he could be on the rim. So the amount of stuff that just has gone in there into building up that skill set is, is immense uh, for it to actually give you the dividends that you're seeing right there. I'll just jump back into... Here we go. Back to this, the slides there, Reese. Yep. So... Common ball screen. So we, every team pretty much provided um, a lot of ball screen options. And, and so we saw, you know, the step up drag, um, double drags, side ball screen, slot ball screen, middle ball screens, horn ball screen. So um, to sort of have a little bit of a snapshot of, um, you know, what, what I'm talking about here, I'm just going to flip. Going to flip back into this one. Try and kill that volume for you. I don't want to blow anyone's ears off. And all right, how are we going there? Yeah, we got that. So um, just to cover off on some of those different options, what they look like, so we're all on the same page. Step up screen. So obviously step ups we're seeing in the back court, front court, half court offense. Um, in this case, Nate, Nate for us just button hooks back in, wipes out DJ's man. Now we're in a downhill action. Great spacing off the ball. Mirko to the corner. The other two guys are pinned. Cam now reads ability to put pressure on the rim. Again, a lot going into that. But um, step ups. Everyone found some good value in the league out of step up. Drag screen. Now, this is, I bring this because even with the defense covered back to a pretty reasonable spot, um, it's still some, some advantage. A uh, little typo there. Uh, still some advantage for, uh, for us because Mitch Norton just gets pushed a little deep off Scott, just trying to cover back and stop the drive. So now he's a little late to cover. Nick Kay has to stay too long. A little drag screen. We get a wide open shot. Nuances. Um, double drag again mixed coverage so you get the double drag maybe they have uniform coverage maybe they have mixed coverage right here there's a mixed coverage so Mitch doesn't know which one's first he has to kind of guess and look over his shoulder that takes his attention away so all of a sudden we get out of the first one we hit the second one and it means that that Plumlee's now having to play one-on-one -on -one with uh, our point guard who can just drag him all the way down. And again, we just find a wide open shooter. Side ball screen. And this has probably dropped down a little bit in our league and more higher middle ball screen happening. But um, when we get to the side, 
Mirko does a great job here just with keeping his, side, his ball screen to the side, not getting dragged up to the chemist warehouse sign. And it just allows him some driving. Now, we've kind of lifted all three guys off the ball unintentionally here, which is not ideal. We would have liked to have kept one guy below the block at least, uh, perhaps right on the baseline. But uh, still enough space for Mirko to be able to go and attack. So the side ball screen still around for us. Um, slot ball screen. So we slip out and right there. So that slot area that we, is our reference. Again, you can see the spacing is found nice and quickly. We can tap, attack the drop coverage in this instance. We'll talk a little bit more about coverages later. Um, middle ball screen was, was super common. And with the, some of the stud guards that we have in the league, obviously we had Scott and we knew that was an advantage to us to put him in that. Casper Ware, Bryce Cotton, um, even some of the wing guys like Lamar Patterson, Scotty Hobson are just so incredibly hard to guard in this space of the floor. And um, so everyone found a way to get their stud into that. You know, we would get Scott into several ball screens. There you see that ability again to play through physical contact. And as everyone would probably know, the horn spacing, um, Scott does a nice job here knocking Damo off attacking the coverage he wants. Again, you see two coverages in a double ball screen. Um, he chooses the one he wants. We play accordingly. So that's what I mean by those terms. That's what we saw um, a lot from every team. So we had to prepare for um, every one of those every game. So every team would have their base coverages uh, around those things. And then obviously, depending on the strengths and weaknesses, could you know, tilt them in different, uh, different directions. Has anyone got any questions so far through, uh, through any of that stuff? Uh, just uh, one that I'll throw to you now, um, just because it's sort of timely with something you said earlier around um, the age or level you should bring pick and roll in. Uh, what's sort of your opinion on that? It's, it's based on assessment of, of their ability. So, yep. so if, the skill set and the mental skills, uh, team concepts are uh, in place for, for um, and mostly I'll talk about that decision-making phase, um, that if they can do that, then you can start to bring in some of these other things. Um, if, and that, and I mean by, what I mean by that is all five players on the court. Yep. Because as you saw in those clips there, and you'll see as a common theme, spacing and timing, uh, reading of the defense, um, is everyone's responsibility in the pick and roll, not just the guy dribbling the ball. And so that's a lot of, a lot of uh, pressure and a lot of reps that need to, to occur for players to be good enough to punish the defense. Sure, no, that's great. So um, the next thing I'll just talk about is uh, what, what I call, we call here is uh, automatics. So, um, and the common ones that we sort of see here. So different coverages, um, drops coverage a lot of the time the guard sort of snakes and tries to attack two on one uh, we're starting and seeing a bit more of the last year or two um, the gore tight option which is the roller re going down and screening his own man uh, down at the rim we'll have a look at that um, some ice coverage so it's sort of just pinning it to a sideline and um, teams looking to either drag that coverage or flip the ball screen and turn it into a basically a drop uh, which where everyone's comfortable uh, um, attacking. Um, it was pretty consistent to see unders turning into re-screens. Um, switches, a, a balance between rolls and slips, but, but the main thing, teams looking to identify the best mis mismatch quickly. Hard to say sometimes. Um, and uh, the hard shows, um, most a lot of slips, a lot of slip outs. Occasionally, like a Casper, the elite guards can split and they're a real threat. Jerome Randall loved to split and super quick, uh, quick little guards. They can really add that to their game. But more often than not, the throw on or throw back to try to expose rotation of the, the tag man in the, in the rollout. Um, blitzes, there was a lot of blitzing middle pick and roll because of the Caspers and the, and the, the um, Cottons and the Machados. And um, pretty much everybody went to short rolling um, that scenario and trying to play four on three on the back end of the, of the middle blitz. And then what, one we haven't really seen in our league and we'll probably see 
uh, creep in a bit is the next coverage. Um, I think Liam's talking about that, some of that coverage. Um, but the best thing I've seen so far with that one, and we'll have a look at one clip there, is just uh, some cutting off off that uh, that side where they jump switch the ball, um, back door out of that corner and drift that man, trying to remove any chance of helping. Um, so I'll have a quick little look at um, at some of those those automatics. There we go. And there they got that one. Yep. So uh, yeah, the drops coverage. So obviously that's a pretty been a pretty big topic. Uh, obviously with the Kings, everyone had their opinion about you know, what are they doing and whether it work or whatever. They, I mean they have their theory, um, but it's pretty it's pretty common and um, and the analytics suggest that it's um, that it's an effective model against a lot of players. Not every player, but a lot of players. Uh, so we'll see here. Um, try and get that rolling for us. So, ball screen drop coverage. The guard snakes his way back in front of his own player. He now has taken him out of the game. They choose not to to attack the roll man with a tagger. So it's two. It's flat out two on two. And so we now see the big eliminate the one remaining defender with that Gortat screen. So he screens his own man in around the cup. Now there's nobody left. And so this has been um, a type of action that uh, teams use NBA and in EuroLeague. The snake action, extremely common. The Gortat screen um, is around. Um, and we even sort of toyed with it a little bit ourselves um, this year. Now, when they get into help, because there's a lot of times they'll want to tag and um, and be part of it. So and this is just an example of when you get the nail guy wanting to just be there and be that tag and be that safety, that ability now to quickly make decisions. Great job, quick out, quick in. It's reasonably difficult to deal with Nate at the cup uh, on your own, even if you're someone like Hodgie who's pretty good defender and shot blocker and it's uh, it's really tough. But that, that's set up by his teammates. Um, now, if they hear Adelaide, rather than tag from the nail, so Moore doesn't do anything about that, he lets it happen. Dan Dillon wants to try and have a bite, maybe a little late, but great vision, quick decision, quick decision again, and we're on the rim. So punishing that, that tagger and finding that tagger. Ice, so Perth here just tried to ice us to the sideline. Bit of a drag screen, Nate, little butt screen. DJ drags it. Now, not everyone can shoot it like we've seen a lot of the Cam Oliver clips so far. Um, so Nate's, you know, prefers to find other ways to impact the defense. So he might be wide open, but here they get into a little get game. Now, all of a sudden, they've flipped him into a drop coverage and DJ Newble's going against a five, attacking the rim. And so he creates an advantage for his teammate. So there's ways to go. And then ice coverage. Nate's ready to set a little drag and then realises the ice coverage. So he just flips the screen. The last second um, gives DJ Nubel now one-on-one with their five. He's hand down, hand down, uh, wide open shot. Unders, a lot of teams like to go under far out, but uh, in this case, this is pretty tight in the three-point line. So it was, it was a bit of a gamble to go under. But straight away, Nate uh, recognises, rescreens. Scott doesn't want to settle. He knows he's going to force that guy to come over the top now because if he goes under again, it's a, a wide open three. So he's got to chase him. It forces extra cover off the nail. Some awesome spacing on that clip and decision making by the group. Switches are pretty common. And so a few things here. One, in this instance, when you kind of know, so Majuk knows there's a high probability of a switch right now because there's two guards in the coverage. So slipping out against that is often a good thing. Now they've got a little bite out of the corner. So you've got Mirko who's a good shooter, uh, maybe in the corner. But better than that is just chasing the gap because Shea Ely had to change his 
his stance to switch and now there's no switch and you can tack out. So if you get teams switching a lot uh, on you in the pick and roll, you know, slipping out can be a good method to um, open up a driving lane and now we're into decision-making time again. As I spoke about before, switching um, and finding mismatches. So let it roll a little bit. We get the switch up on top and it's really hard to make that pass. Like even if Cam presented it really early, it's really difficult to make that initial pass, especially over a seven footer and, um, and you know, that, that wingspan. But if you can throw it on or throw it back and then we can isolate down low. So nice job to throw it back. Cam does a pretty good job of pinning it. And now we can kind of go to work. It's, they have really have to send a double at that point. Um, in this one, in this one, a little different. So DJ gets the switch. He realizes it. So he, he, um, he pulls back on the, what we call the slingshot. So he slingshots back. Then he, he realizes that uh, the spacing is still a little clogged. So he just uses a boomerang pass. Just shifts the, everyone just slightly, just relaxes everyone slightly. And now DJ feels like he's got a much better space and he's dragged back so he can get ahead of steam. So he goes downhill at, you know, their five man or four man. Um, our spacing is reasonably good. Cam should have been in the corner, but he can get to it. Hard shows, we probably get a lot more hard shows um, of late in our league and it's pretty common at most levels of the game, the switching and showing um, and drops, I guess, are probably the three more common things right across the board. But hard show, Nate feels his man jumping. So as soon as he knows that he's not, he's, his man's not beneath him, just get out of there. And this instance, Chris has got to decide between Nate on the rim and DJ on the three-point line and he wants no part of either. And then if you can't if you can't do that, so we'll get another little hard show. Now Cam does a really good job here and of knocking Nick K out of the way. So Nick's now a little bit late to get and show out. So DJ can get around it. Now it gets around it, we are four on three. And so that little relay pass uh, to Cam, because Cam did the hard work stopping Nick K show out really quick. Last one on this is the throwback. So this one, DJ uh, for Adelaide, 21 there, Daniel Johnson, he's out early and we can't get around that. So we now need to look and see back the other way. So throw back. And our DJ Nuble realizes that, doubles back, and now we can look to attack. In this case, he feels like he has that advantage, but it could have been then going inside. Great decision with overhelp. They're late to run on. Uh, the blitzing, as I said, this was really common. So everyone went to, to short rolling. Little blitz, short roll, Cam gets it. Usually a four on three. It's actually a three on two this time because Scotty Hobson wanted to chase DJ Nuble right out there by the sticker. Um, so it's even easier for us um, to go and attack out of that. Pretty hard to now cover these three guys. You've got two shooters lined up who are over 40% three-point shooters and Cam Oliver's bearing down at the end of the rim. Um, last one, just around that next coverage. So, so they get into some pick and roll action over there on the slot. The defender uh, sitting up here is ready to jump switch. And it's a... I, Admit it's a reasonably poor job, but you see the cutting action. So he doesn't do a great job. And now the corner man, far corner, if he cuts, no help on this fade. And so this is probably one that I've uh, taken a fancy to watching some of the EuroLeague stuff. Um, it's not the only option. There's a few other little ways to attack it, but this has been difficult, um, especially if the jump switch is even slightly off. Has anyone any, uh, any questions around some of those automatics? Or, or no, Not that they're the only ways to play it. They, I remember I'm giving a broad uh, stroke of what's sort of happening um, at the moment, in the, particularly in the NBL. 
Coach, there was one just around, um, and you had one clip in there of sort of the, the get action or uh, the throw and chase, whatever you want to call it. Um, would you look to use that much, like the pinch post sort of get action? Um, and could you touch on that? As a, as a very yeah, and we'll, we'll actually, we'll, we'll touch a little bit more just through that, the, the remaining bit, but it's, um, it's definitely uh, a way to, into the ball screening game or out of it, um, it's a way to combat the defense if they've if they're they're pretty good. Like they if they're pretty organised with their coverage, to just put them off a little bit, uh, or to recover out of them doing a great job initially. So it's pretty common, and um, teams are constantly looking to to use the pinch post or the get action. Um, certainly in our game, um, but also a lot of the Euro stuff that I've been watching. Um, it's a pretty heavy theme. Um, particularly Euro League level, um, so yeah, no, definitely would definitely encourage um, teams to to do that, and plus upskilling of of your players, um, you know, putting putting uh, players in those situations to be able to make some reads out of those uh, handoffs is 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 good upskilling. Thanks for that. So. The next thing is is um, disruption and disguise. So we sort of talked a lot about just really the ball screen and then the guys off the screen, uh, some different coverages, obviously, or the common coverages that we're seeing for those different scenarios. But what teams are doing because they're so organised in their defensive schemes is you just can't stand and deliver ball screen because they're just too good. And so what level of disruption can you have? And that's one of them is, is that little get action that you talk about but various cuts you know loop cuts uh, flash cuts uh, button hooks back into 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 ball screens um, dribble handoff then into a ball screen like a pistol kind of action uh, the gets action we spoke about dummy ball screens ball screen one side and just play out of it loose um, and then attack on the other side hoping you've just opened up the coverage because they've had to sort of semi defend a ball screen already one that you weren't intending to score out of um, off the ball screens, down screens, flare screens to just create lag in the in the ball ball, uh, ball screen defenders. Uh, flip action. So in this, not I'm not talking about flipping the screen. I'm talking about the middle ground between a pass and then chase your pass into a ball screen and a dribble handoff. So a lot of teams have one scheme for a say a 45 pick and roll and another scheme for a 45 dribble handoff and they don't necessarily match. So when you get into that halfway in between space, they can get confused on the coverage really easily. Um, and we saw a little bit of that this year. Uh, go screen, super popular, uh, or slip, they're slipping out, but slipping out more so to the three point line than they are to the rim. Um, and wedge screens being screens for the big and allowing the big to play off a pick and roll. Um, and so as we get more dynamic fours and teams consistently having more dynamic four men um, and even five men um, with the small ball, allowing them to be able to play off the pick and roll um, is, is a good tactic. Um, and then on the other end, disguise. So I talked a little bit about that in the last one, maybe a dummy ball screen into a, into a live one, but uh, a ball screen that then is really just trying to set up a duck in for a big man. A ball screen that's just trying to set up a flare back for the ball handler. So you come off it, get rid of it, flare back off the original ball screen guy and, and get a look for a shooter. Um, some ghost screen, so slipping and then pinning away for a shooter and bringing a shooter back to the action. Um, stack action, which is back screening the, the, the roll guy. Um, hammer action, which is usually associated with rips, rips away from ball screens that we had a look at right at the beginning. Uh, and then flaring a shooter on the help side. Um, and then one that's um, gathering a bit of momentum, um, just some stampede or roadrunner action, which is really just trying to get a guard off the, off the ball screen into a downhill drive. Um, and so we'll have a little, little bit of a look at um, some disruption and, and um, disguise. Get rid of that volume. Okay. 
So as we go through this, we'll just have a little look at, at um, what teams are doing for their, their disruption. And um, Perth were, were heavily, heavily into drag screens for Bryce. They, they had a lot of off the ball shooting stuff this year for their shooters, having three elite shooters. And, um, but they would definitely drag screen a lot for Bryce. So we spoke about that as, a, as an issue with multiple coverages and they get confused. Uh, Sydney, they had a few different ways, but this horn stuff with the big, uh, sorry, with the guard and then really turning into a, like a, again, a double ball screen or a double drag, but with a guard. Um, so that's a creative way to, um, to create confusion out of the coverage. So, you know, great disruption. Melbourne, a lot of turnouts into ball screen. So this could be a ghost screen right now. So he's come off a pin. He's come off a pin underneath. They've been pretty loose. He can screen or slip out of that. And you'll see on the other side here, you've got another screener to screen the screener action on top. So it's, they're really just trying to set up here um, and get you to cover something else. So this ball screen here could end up being another ball screen with Sean Long, as we see here. And it stretches the coverage. So it's, dis it's disruption to the coverage. And you just you really have to do it more often than not. Adelaide love their turnout series with Joey. And they would either cross screen this guy into a drag type setup or a step up. A lot for Randall. Get him some downhill. Southeast Melbourne love their ball screens. Had a bunch. One just to show some variation. So their disruption is just to screen away initially and then bring, in this case, Roberson would be coming back to get it and then get a ball screen, but he'd get top lock a lot. So they'd get that little gets action you just spoke about, Reese, and then turn it into a ball screen. So all that disruption beforehand now distorts the coverage and Perth who are you know, pretty well drilled defensive team are stretched right now uh, to deal with this ball screen. Brisbane, um, again, had multiple ways, but one pretty common one for them was the ball screen on top was really just there to disrupt and then create this cross screen action underneath and try to get a high percentage shot at the rim. It was, a, it was if it's not there, then you've got Sobey on a screen, the screen up, come back to the top and he'd probably get a gets or a, um, or a ball screen himself. Illawarra, they like to play particularly early in the year, this sort of, this sort of spacing and then as they swing the ball, X off, the, X off the post or back screen and then run out into a ball screen. Ogilvy does a nice job of flipping the, the cheat on the defense. New Zealand had some great ways to get into it. And there's a bit of a Euro influence, obviously, with their coach um, being in the Middle East. And, but the big actually down screening. So all this disruption to what they really wanted. Little... Dribble handoff into the ball screen. Robbie then realizes he can't screen, so he just flips it, brings him back. You know, it's, it's stretched the coverage. No one's in there to help on it. Uh, really nice action. We used a lot of ghost screens in different ways. Uh, Cam just ghosts out, spaces, stretches the defense. We've opened the lane up. Nate realizes that the coverage on the ball sees him, so he flips the screen, puts him out of position. Uh, and DJ's able to go and attack. Now they're, they're trying to, this is a defense, I don't want to go on a defensive clinic, but they're now trying to switch back because they're mismatched. So they're going to try and switch back on the fly. Our guys are quick enough to realize that and then throw out. Now they're, they're in trouble. And just league wide, this is what I was talking about with that wedge screen. This is one example, but the guard just stepping in and screening for the big. Uh, and Majuk does a nice job of turning the corner on that one. So a lot of disruption, ways to get into different kind of ball screens that you like for your guys, but to put the defense on the back foot. And then uh, disguise. So you're running a ball screen, but you actually are trying to set up something else. So in this instance, we're looking to try to attack on the, the help side. So JK just times his cut beautifully, slides underneath the defense uh, and Mirko lifts out. Um, in this instance, we spoke about this duck in. So again, we're playing a ball screen and, and it's still live, but if it's not 
um, you know, a, a lay down was there. You know, we really know what we've got coming next and using Nate into this duck in, um, you know, that cover man's really thinking about guard and fab on that rollout and that puts him at a disadvantage now that Nate's duck in. So good, good disguise into what we were looking for there. Um, flare back, probably could have found some better clips with this because they were going to switch anyway, but we just come off loosely off the ball screen and their little coverage and then just flare. We just flare him back. Defense is caught underneath. So see a little bit of that. A few different teams. Brisbane were big on it the year before. The stack, we've seen, I think a lot of people would have seen a lot of the stack where it's generic. In this case, so I grabbed this one just because it was a different coverage. So we've got Nate screening and then Mirko's coming up the middle to screen the screener, rolling to the rim. But they get after it. But the action itself still creates distortion. We have three on two now uh, back here, this side of the floor. Uh, so Scott's good enough to make his read. He gets out the easier side and now he can pick and choose what he wants. Again, just setting up the hammer. So this is where your rips are good. So they're pretty patient here um, in the NBA game. But just fake ball screen. They're getting ready for ball screen coverage. And you'll see on the, the top side, getting ready for this hammer action. They're pretty popular for, I don't know, about a decade or so, uh, but it's still pretty common. And the last one, just with this stampede uh, and Roadrunner. So Perth used this a little bit for Mitch Norton. So they'll play a pistol. They would take something if it was on, but really they're trying to get Mitch, who's just, you know, sitting back um, with the slingshot already. He's sitting back in the slingshot ready to go. So as he gets it, he attacks the guy who should be the nail coverage. You know, he's ready to guard off that nail and make sure there's no drive. And now all of a sudden he's got to close out and Mitch is just going to go head down and attack him. So he has a little driving lane. So it's a good little way to get some speed. And then this one, so instead of him receiving, he just is going to cut through and lift the corner guy. And then he's going to attack the vacuum and get into the lane. And so really nice little concept, seen a little bit more of late. Um, if you've got a, a Brad Newley or a Quat Noy or someone like that, it's a pretty nice little action for them and trying to guard those guys. Or a Mitch Creek, you know, there's a lot of guys that are super athletic that can really do some damage. So you might have a driver, non-shooter, non and you can, you can um, try to maximise him. So we're back on the slides there, Reese. Yeah. So just uh, a bit of a summary. Um, you know, on ball screens, really common, really effective. Um, you know, the advanced skill set, and I probably can't stress that enough, the advanced skill set required before we, we put our players in that position uh, and making sure that we've, we've made some inroads in that area, um, that every player's involved. We're not just talking about the guy dribbling the ball everyone's involved or it's going to be very difficult for, for your team to score effectively, consistently, especially as you play teams that start to come up with some schemes or even at the younger levels, just play off. And they're just all standing in the lane and, and uh, you can't punish them. Um, so it's not suitable for all levels and it's, uh, it's each coach's job to decide if it's right. Obviously, we're seeing that we're working with you know, any spacing and any action preceding or post the ball screen. So you can get as creative as you want and look at the strengths of your players and try to build it in um, to suit them and, and what they can and can't do. Um, and obviously the fun bit is the fact that both, both sides of the ball, the strategy just keeps evolving every year. So it's, it's fun um, because you're getting, you're getting hit with a slightly different concept or different skill set of players in similar actions um, almost it feels like on a weekly basis, um, we're all trying to <laughs> outsmart each other and you know uh, out attack the coverage. Um, so it's a great game of chess, you know, and uh, and obviously fun to get into. But you you need your skill, your players at the level to be able to really enjoy it and get into it. Um, so hopefully, you know, throughout all of that, um, everyone's got something to take away around the ball screening. Um, hopefully um, everyone um, realizes that we're all part of, um, you know, one community here and to share information. And it's not just listening to um, one or two people that are deemed to be the, 
the knowledge of the game. Like it's every single coach uh, that I speak to, you know, has something that, that I can learn from uh, and vice versa. And so the more you can speak to other coaches, the better um, and work out what you like. And sometimes some of the best things conversations I've ever had is to talk to someone who has no idea about it at all. And say, what did you see? What did you like? What was that? And their, their terminology might be different. They're going to make something up. Maybe I've asked footy coaches a bit about what do you see? What do you like? What do you not like? And they'll talk to me in their footy terms, but we, you know, we work it out and we translate it. And then all of a sudden a light bulb goes off in my mind about something uh, that he's seen that maybe we could do differently or he can, transfer from his game and say hey we do this you know what about that and so the more you can talk the better so i'm all for that uh and i think we, we all have to be part of it and be proactive in it and not you know keeping our cards um you know close to our chest because you know we're we're in this game for a short time really I hope this game's going to go for a long time after us so you can contact feel free to flick me an email a uh, text or, or hit me up on twitter so that info is there uh, reese i can give you this um, presentation and um, so you can pass info out or whatever but I'm I'm definitely happy to um, keep the conversation rolling so hopefully you've all got something from it um, and if you've got some questions please whether it's to this or whatever else please fire away thanks so so much coach I might um, just stop your sharing yeah there we go um, thanks so much for that that was fantastic um, you know great great breakdown of um, you know, obviously the NBL, but it's obviously not just the same way playing the NBL is played in, you know, professional leagues across the world, but it was just great to see um, detail and, and different things. Um, got a couple of questions. Um, first one, I'm going to throw to Al McCautry um, to ask his. Hey, Jay, how are you? I'm good, bro. You all right? Yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, obviously, the, the you touched on the skill level of... Um, and uh, in your presentation, there was some uh, pretty advanced skill. Um, for a young player trying to make it or break into the league or break into that, that uh, environment, how much work would go in on a daily or weekly basis um, around the certain skill set um, required to be at that level? And, and obviously, it's an ongoing thing. Can you, can you? It's a two-part question. Can you give us give us an idea or a snapshot on what type of things, you know, one or two things that are required from your end to deal with all those coverages? Yeah. Uh, and the, uh, so yeah, if you could touch on that. Yeah. No, absolutely. And um, like I said, you you have to make an assessment of your players, and if you don't feel that you are um, that you can make that decision, then then that's a great time to go and ask uh, another coach to 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 have a look and say what do you, what do you think? You know, um, do you feel like I can get into this space, or do we need to do a bit more work before it? But I mean, even with our even with our guys, um, we are working the basic uh, the basic skills of general basketball to set you up to play in this. So um, we have our vitamin sessions every day. We have them game day. Um, we are rehearsing um, the skill set, um, often often with um, coverage from the coaches so that they're playing against some, with some decision-making um, and under some different pressures. Um, so the dribbling, the ball handling and the passing under pressure for everybody um, is, is uh, super critical. Um, the second one is a spacing I can't stress enough how important it is everyone understands their role in helping the pick and roll. It doesn't matter what the coverage is. If, if your spacing is really good, it's so much easier to play. Um, it makes every defensive coverage difficult because every coverage is wanting to load the floor up. Um, the timing then of how you move out of it. And that's, that's the guard. If you come off too early, you cause offensive fouls. The big, you know, you go and, move a little bit and it becomes you move early and it becomes a moving screen the spaces you cut too early and you get covered uh, or you're out of sync with the passer so they don't find you so uh, again we rehearse that stuff all the time and we, we're we're on top of our guys about no you got to go you got to wait another second um, you got to allow this to to play out 
Um, so getting kids to understand it. And then, like I said several times in it, and um, is that decision, ability decision making, which for mine, it's like the, one of the first things I want to do when I, I grab the, the under 10 team is I want to go, I want to have two on one from the foul line. Like I just wanted to make some decisions and, and the expo like their skill could be all over the shop, but it's just making decisions and wouldn't be uncommon for it to be, you know, the defense wins nine, nine, one in 10 possessions. Um, but they're learning about the decision-making because the decision-making takes pressure off the skill. If the decision-making is bad, then the skill needs to be crazy, crazy good um, to deal with the pressures. So um, the more we can do around that, the better. Great, mate. Thank you. Well done. Good presentation too. Thanks, Al. Thanks, Al. Um, great, great answer, Coach. Um, we'll have one last one just because I'm cognizant of getting into um, Coach Flynn's presentation. Um, Paris, I'll throw to you to ask your question, mate. Thanks, mate. Hey, Coach. Um, I saw in a lot of your on-ball stuff, you were getting your screener to hit uh, inside shoulder or low inside shoulder. Is that something that you emphasize for your screener? Um, and is it purposely done to get that on-ball defender to go or bait over the top yep. to give you that yep. two-on-one? Yeah, spot on. So we... we, we um, some of the things that are uh, super important, the one is, is, is rip away from the ball screen for the guard and for the big. Um, there's exceptions, but a common, a common thing for us is to screen you know, the, the, the back of the shoulder, uh, the low side of the shoulder. And you're right, it's, it's to try to force the hand of the coverage to go um, the way we would like it to go. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a thing for us. And, um, and obviously we do change from time to time based on how teams might be trying to play um, their coverages, but it's more of our, of our normal. Thanks, Matt. Thanks so much, um, Jamie, for that. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, all the coaches will get heaps out of that. And uh, I'm sure you'll get, you'll get some follow-up out of this. But, yeah, thanks again for giving up your time. Uh, no worries at all. Absolute uh, pleasure to, to be involved with this stuff. Um, and like I said, this is, this is an overview. There's a lot of stuff thrown, an awful lot of stuff around. Um, so um, as I said, we could sit there and have a whole bunch of, you know, do deep dives on the middle pick and roll or the, the, the early pick and roll, or we could do that and talk for days. So, um, you know, if you've got, you've got some questions you want to get into it, then please, please follow up uh, either myself or, or another coach in your space that, um, that you uh, respect. Thank you so much. I'll now introduce